A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy. Today's date is 17th of January 2023. Displayed here are the list of news articles that we are going to discuss today. So without much delay, let us get into the first news article discussion. Now instead of discussing a news article, we shall try something new today. We shall try to solve the quiz question given here in the text and context page. I hope you all know that the third day of the Pongal festival is Matu Pongal. It is a day to celebrate cattle and offer prayers to bulls, cows and other farm animals. This quiz is based on that only. Now let us move on to see the first question. The question asks how many compartments a cow's stomach has. See to answer this question as the question itself mentions technically cows have only one stomach but it has four distinct compartments made up of rumen, reticulum, umasum and abomasum. You can see that in the image given here. Now if you are wondering why such compartments are necessary it is because the grasses and other roughage that cows eat are hard to break down and digest. So that is why cows have specialized compartments. Each compartment has a special function that helps to digest these tough foods. For example, when the cow first eats, it chews the food just enough to swallow it. The unchewed food travel to the first two compartments, the rumen and the reticulum, where it is stored until later. When the cow is full from this eating process, she rests. Later, the cow coughs up bits of the unchewed food called cud and chews it completely this time before swallowing it again. Okay? Now, this time the cud goes to the third and fourth stomachs, that is the omasum and abomasum. Here, they get digested fully. Okay? So, technically, cow have one stomach, but it have four distinct compartments to break down and digest the hard roughages or tough foods it consumes. Okay? Now, moving on to the second question. What is a young female cow called? See, a female calf is sometimes called a heifer calf and a male a bull calf. Here, a heifer is a female that has not had any offspring. Okay? See, I hope you all know that cows can only produce milk once they have given birth to a calf. A cow's pregnancy lasts about 9 months and 10 days. So, if their average lifespan of a cow or buffalo is 15 to 25 years and they generally give birth to their first calf in about 2 years, then a dairy cow can give birth from 1 to 20 calves in her lifetime depending upon its productivity. Okay? So here, a young female cow that has not had any offspring is called heifer. So now moving on to the next question, which state in India is the largest producer of milk? See, according to Ministry of Food Processing Industry, Uttar Pradesh is the highest milk producing state in India. They contribute around 18% to the total milk production. They are followed by Rajasthan 11%, Andhra Pradesh 10%, Gujarat 8% and Punjab 7%. So now moving on to the next question. What common name is used to describe the group of nomadic tribal people found primarily in Tamil Nadu and Kerala who historically made a living by traveling from place to place with a decorated bull entertaining and fortune telling using their cattle. See the answer to this is Boom Boom Matakaran or Adian or Pu Idayar. See they are a group of nomadic tribal people found primarily in Tamil Nadu and Kerala states of India. They historically made a living by traveling from place to place with a decorated bull entertaining and fortune telling using what is generally termed as boom boom ox okay so this is how a boom boom ox looks like now moving on to the final question how many teeth does a cow have see a mature animal have 32 permanent or adult teeth okay so i hope you got an opportunity to know something new through this quiz discussion so these new facts now let us move on to the next news article discussion 
Now look at this editorial article. This editorial article is also about the governor incident in Tamil Nadu which we discussed in our 13th January Hindu newspaper analysis. Before getting into the discussion, a little heads up. You guys are right. It is article 201 under which the governor reserves the bill for the consideration of the president and not article 200. Now coming back, this editorial article says that the Tamil Nadu governor skipping a part of the governor's address is against the constitution. The editorial also highlights various instances where the governor has overextended his position and how this goes against the intention of the constitution makers. So this is about the article given here. In this discussion, we'll discuss the points mentioned in the article in detail. Okay. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this article is highlighted here for your reference. You can go through it. First, let us brush up the event that transpired in the state of Tamil Nadu. See, Governor of Tamil Nadu, Oran Ravi, skipped certain portions of the text of his customary address to the state's legislature, including reference to the Dravidian model of governance. In addition to skipping them, he made some other remarks as well. As a result, the Chief Minister of the State, M.K. Stalin, moved a resolution to exclude from the House records whatever the governor spoke outside the state-drafted speech. Even before the national anthem was played, Governor R. N. Ravi reacted to this in an unprecedented manner by staging a walkout from the House in protest. So this is what happened in the Tamil Nadu State Assembly. Here, I mentioned about the term called the Dravidian model, right? So what does it actually mean? Let me clarify it first before getting into the contents of the article. See, the Dravidian model, like any other development model, is about peace, progress and prosperity. The thing about the Dravidian model is that peace, progress and prosperity are achieved through the principles of social justice, principle of equity and rational thought. The Dravidian model also focuses on democratizing public spaces like government offices and the legislature for the wider participation and representation of the public. So through this, the government in the Dravidian model aims to improve the access to quality education, quality health care and quality nutrition to everyone in the society. The Dravidian model also focuses on balancing industrial growth along with agriculture. So this is the basics about the Dravidian model. Now what about the origin of this model? See, it was tracked back to the non-Brahmin movement in Madras state before independence. The non-Brahmin movement culminated in the formation of the South Indian Liberal Federation or the Justice Party. The Justice Party focused on social justice. The party came to power after the Montague Chelmsford reforms of 1919. After coming to power, they passed the communal GO in 1921 to increase the proportion of post held in administration by the non-Brahmins. This move of the Justice Party practically fueled the Dravidian model. Although this can be termed as the origin, the proper shape to the Dravidian model was provided by Mr. E. V. Ramasamy, who is famously called Periyar. Periyar expanded the scope of the Dravidian model. He focused on the upliftment of all the disadvantaged sections of the society like women, STs and SCs, physically challenged and the poor. So in the present context, the Dravidian model focuses on uplifting all the disadvantaged sections of society and creating a level playing field in access to government services, education and health. Finally, we can conclude that the Dravidian model is not about equality but about equity and social justice. So in the pursuit of the Dravidian model, the government of Tamil Nadu took up various welfare schemes that have yielded success for Tamil Nadu and these are also replicated nationwide. Some famous products of the Dravidian model include midday meal scheme, free bus pass to school children, cycles and laptops to school children, free bus ride for women, financial incentive for women who complete schooling in the form of Muvalur Ramamirdam Ammayar Higher Education Assurance Scheme. Then reservation for women in government employment, free color TV, Amma canteen to provide food for the urban poor, 
cradle baby scheme to bring down female infanticide and etc so to know more about the dravidian model and the success story of tamil nadu you can check out the video titled how tamil nadu's socio economic model made it the second richest state in india gdp see it is a case study which was uploaded by the think school youtube channel some 3 weeks ago so you can just watch it so from our discussion until now the achievements of tamil nadu is mainly due to its pursuit of the dravidian model so naturally both the people of tamil nadu and the government of tamil nadu hold it in high regard this is why when the governor skipped the part of his speech which referred to the dravidian model of governance the tamil nadu cm was upset and moved a resolution against him okay so according to the author of the editorial the governor of the state is entitled to his opinion he can have his own likes and dislikes but when it comes to constitutional duty he must perform it by keeping aside his personal opinion so to substantiate this the author of the editorial refers to two articles from the constitution and the difference between them the first one is article 175 see according to article 175 the governor may address the state legislative assembly or state legislative council or both the houses of the legislative together while making such an address the governor might require the attendance of the members of the legislature the governor's address under article 175 is not mandatory also article 175 does not speak about any discussion of the content of such an address by the governor finally when addressing the legislature under article 175 the governor can express his mind and is not under any restriction now contrast to this with article 176 clause 1 See this article says that the governor shall address the state legislature at the commencement of the first session after each general election to the legislative assembly and at the commencement of the first session of each year. Here notice that article 175 uses the word may and the article 176 clause 2 uses the word shall. So under article 175 the governor may or may not address the legislature but under article 176 the governor should address the legislature also as we saw under article 175 the governor can express his mind but it is different under article 176 article 176 contains the policies and programs of the elected government of the state the governor's address under article 176 is not the opinion of the governor but the elected government of the state so basically the elected government through the governor's address informs the legislature of its major legislative programs for that year along with that it informs about its achievements in the previous year and its developmental progress for the future so the governor's address under article 176 assumes great importance so the governor has no business altering it if you notice the wording carefully article 176 says governor shall address the address here means the complete address and not a truncated or the altered version now moving on to the clause 2 of article 176 see clause 2 mentions about the discussion about the contents of the governor's address by the legislature so the legislature need not discuss the address made by the governor under article 175 but for the governor's address under article 176 the legislature need to mandatorily discuss it through this discussion the legislature holds the executive accountable and we know that accountability of the executive to the legislature is one of the essence of parliamentary democracy so the governor's address under article 176 plays an important function and according to the author of the editorial the governor considering the importance of his role under article 176 should have read out the content of his speech in full without altering it also the governor cannot willfully skip paragraphs of the address this is because as we just saw the constitution does not permit him to disagree with the matters contained in the address or interpose his own views in his address under article 176 
The author also says that due to actions like this, in some of the opposition ruled states, the whole office of the governor is under scrutiny. The author is of the opinion that if the office of the governor adheres to Supreme Court judgments, there would not be any issue like this. Here he mentions two Supreme Court judgments, the Sham Sher Singh case of 1974 and the Nabam Rebai case of 2016. In both these cases, the Supreme Court mentioned that the governors can act only on the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers and cannot exercise any executive powers independently. The court also said that the governor does not have overriding authority over the elected representatives. Finally, the author concluded the editorial by quoting Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. In the Constituent Assembly, Dr. Ambedkar said that governor should be a purely constitutional governor with no power of interference in the administration of the province. So, the governor of India must follow the spirit of the constitution makers and prevent further conflicts with the state governments. Okay? So, this is all regarding this news article discussion. Since this is an evergreen topic, the conflict between governor and the state government will always be in the news. So, we can always expect a question regarding this in our examination. So, note down all the points that we just discussed. It is very important. Okay? So, with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now, for our next discussion, let us take up this news article. It says that according to Mr. P. Srikumar, ISRO is yet to receive approval from the Union Government for the Venus mission. Know that he is the advisor to ISRO's Space Science Program. So, he is saying that due to the delay in approval, the mission might get postponed it to 2031 and this is the crux of the news article given here. So in this context let us see what is this Venus mission of ISRO and some of the important points mentioned in the news article. First of all know that ISRO's Venus mission is called as Sukrayan 1. This Sukrayan is an orbiter. I hope you all know about an orbiter. An orbiter is a spacecraft designed to orbit a celestial body without landing on its surface. The spacecraft will contain a synthetic aperture radar and a ground penetrating radar. These radars are used to study the atmosphere and subsurface of Venus. Okay? And we also know that Venus is covered with sulfuric acid clouds which makes the visible observations impossible, right? So, the radars will penetrate these clouds and gives information about the hottest planet in the solar system. Apart from the radars, it also contains the Venusian Neutrals Analyzer. This helps to study how charged particles from the sun interact with Venus's atmosphere. So, this is about the mission and its components. Now, let us see how it will be launched. See, the equipments will be carried by the GSLV Mark II spaceship to investigate the Venusian environment. Initially, it was decided to launch the mission in 2023, but now it was expected to be launched in December 2024. Here, you must think why the year 2024 was chosen. It is because during that time only, Earth and Venus will be sufficiently aligned such that the orbiter can be placed in the Venus orbit with least amount of propellant. Okay? We call this as optimal launch windows. And know that this optimal launch windows occurs once around every 19 months. So this is why ISRO has backup launch dates in 2026 and 2028 if it misses the 2024 opportunity. Okay? There are also even more optimal windows. This means that these windows will further reduce the amount of fuel required at liftoff. But this kind of optimal windows comes only around every 8 years, okay? And this is exactly why in the article Mr. Sri Kumar said that if there is any delay then the mission will be postponed to 2031. He also said that US and European space agencies also have planned for Venus mission in 2031. The name of the Venus mission of US is Veritas. And European Space Agency is Envision. Okay? So, make note of all these points. 
there might be a prelims question based on these facts that's all about this new article discussion in this new article discussion we saw in detail about sukrayon 1 then we saw how it will be launched and why the year 2024 was chosen so these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion now look at this news article here it says that mv ganga vilas the world's longest river cruise got stuck due to low water levels in the ganga but this was denied by the inland waterways authority of india iwai the authority is saying that the vessel will continue its journey irrespective of the delay so this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us understand about iwai from prelims perspective first of all you should understand the need for such an authority see india has about 14500 km of navigable waterways this comprises rivers canals backwaters creeks and etc about 55 million tons of cargo is being moved annually by inland water transport that is iwt so to develop and regulate inland waterways for shipping and navigation inland waterways authority of india that is iwai was established on 27th october 1986 it was constituted as per the IWAI Act 1985. Okay. Know that the head office of the authority is at Noida. The authority also has its regional offices at Patna, Kolkata, Guwahati, and Kochi. Now let us see about its composition. See the authority consists of a chairman, a vice chairman, not more than three full-time members, and not more than three part-time members. As per the IWAI Act 1985. They all are appointed by the central government. I hope now you could understand the purpose of this authority. Now finally, let us conclude this news article discussion by seeing about the functions of the authority. See, the functions of the authority are classified into two categories. One is its functions regarding to National Waterways NW. See, the National Waterways Act 2016 list the different national waterways in India. Go and see the act and read about the different national ways in India. Here remember you need not memorize everything. When it comes to national ways, the functions of the authority includes survey, navigation, infrastructure and regulation, fairway development, pilotage, coordination of inland water transport with other modes of transport. Okay. Now the other category is the general category. Generally its functions include advising the central government, then carrying out hydrographic surveys, then assisting the state governments, then developing consultancy services. Along with that they also do research and development and they classify waterways and they help in developing and ensuring the following of standards and safety. So these are all some of the important points that you have to remember about. IWAI or Inland Waterways Authority of India. So these learnt points. Now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now look at this news article. It talks about an app called Chat GPT. If you have watched our newspaper analysis on 9th January 2023, we would have discussed about something called as the generative AI. To get a holistic understanding on this topic, you can refer to that video as well. See nowadays artificial intelligence related articles are appearing frequently in the news. So it becomes important for you to study this topic extensively. In this particular article, the author talks about chat GPT. Here chat GPT means chat generative pre-trained transformer. And he also explains how it can be used for purposes for which it is not intended for. Okay, so with this note, we'll start the discussion. Have a look at the syllabus for this new article discussion. It is important from both your prelims and mains perspective. Okay, first we will try to understand about this particular application, Chat GPT. See, basically, it is a question answering artificial intelligence developed by OpenAI. Here, OpenAI is a company. Okay. So, it answers complex questions conversationally. So, what is so different with this app? You may think we use chat box commonly nowadays. But this particular app is trying to learn what humans mean when they ask a question. It has the ability to provide human quality responses. It is not the only thing it can do. 
to understand what it can do you should understand something called llm llm means large language model see large language models that is llms are artificial intelligence tools that can read summarize and translate text most importantly it can predict future words in a sentence like autocomplete but at a mind bending scale now look at this image a particular website is designed to generate automatic reviews about movies when we give small prompt about the movie for example i have fed in this data previously that is the movie is not at all nice in a negative way now when i type in this prompt i love this movie the application based on the earlier data i have fed in understands that love means a positive word so it can generate a positive review for the movie with the help of small prompts that i give about the movie okay the reader will not know if a person has written the review or a bot has written it so basically llm generates sentences that are very similar to how humans talk and write this ability allows them to write paragraphs and entire pages of content so this chat gpt app we are talking about is also a large language model chatbot and it is additionally equipped with reinforcement learning with human feedback or in, which is in short called as rl hf training okay but why is the author claiming that the cyber security experts and academicians are concerned about this application we'll see that now see the cyber security experts are concerned about the ability of the chatbot in correcting and enhancing harmful codes and in writing phishing emails illicit actors have tried to bypass the tools safeguards they carried out malicious use cases with varying degree of success which means the application is not 100% secure also cyber security firm checkpoint tested the bot by asking it to draft a pisping email in response chat gpt gave an impressive pisping email this in spite of the fact that chat gpt is programmed to block obvious request of writing pisping emails or malicious code for hackers the cyber security firm warned that we should be vigilant and cautious about adopting this chat gpt technology quickly otherwise our community will be one step behind the attackers apart from the cyber security concerns there is another strain with respect to academics the teachers and academicians are worried about the bot's impact on writing assignments this is because the bot could be used to write plagiarized essays that are hard to detect for those who don't know what is plagiarism it is simply a practice of using another person's idea or work and pretending that it is your own for example we know this poem the woods are lovely dark and deep right someone can change one or two words in this poem and claim that it is theirs so this is called plagiarism now the new york city education department has banned chat gpt in its public schools this particular application can choose the most probable word in the most probable location far more often than a human writer also humans tend to deviate while writing but models like gpt deviate much less on average even though there are plagiarism detectors that can detect this type of behavior pretty reliably there are also times when some formal contents cannot be differentiated some formal contents of the nature that both human and the app write similar content so in such cases we have to come up with new ways to detect plagiarism what experts suggest is that teachers have to come up with innovative projects for students like for example asking them to write their own experiences such a thing could not be done by the chat gpt right apart from these two threats mentioned in the article these kinds of tools can be used to, to create content for malicious purpose as well here such malicious purposes includes deep fakes disinformation and propaganda
So I hope you could learn something new from this news article discussion. So in this news article discussion, we saw in detail about an artificial intelligence application, Chat GPT. So these learned points. Now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now take a look at this news article. It says that RBI has proposed a framework for adoption of an expected loss-based approach for provisioning by banks in India. And as per the article, banks would be allowed to design and implement their own models for measuring expected credit losses. So this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us understand about the credit loss provisioning by banks. So what is credit loss provisioning or loan loss provisioning? See, a loan loss provision is an expense that is set aside for defaulted loans. So a loan loss provision is a cash reserve created by bank to cover the problematic loans. Here problematic loans means loans in which the borrowers will not pay back the loan money to the banks. So in this case, the banks will set aside some money to cover a portion or the entire outstanding balance. Now where will the banks get this money to maintain as a reserve? See, banks will set aside a portion of the expected loan repayments from all loans to cover the losses either completely or partially. Now, can you understand? Let me explain it again. Banks will lend money to different types of consumers like individual consumer, small scale businesses and large corporations. And they lend money for different reasons. And the consumers will pay back the loan money to the bank with some interest, right? But sometimes the consumers will not pay back the money. So the unpaid money is a loss to the bank, right? So here the bank will set aside some money from the loans from which they got the money back to cover the losses of unpaid loans. This is only called as loan loss provisioning, okay? And this cash reserve is maintained as an expenditure in the income statement of a bank. You may think that it is a reserve for the bank. No, think about it. The banks are using it to cover the losses incurred by the default loans. So it is an expenditure for the bank. Okay. Know that till now banks followed incurred loss based approach for the credit loss provisioning. But now RBI has proposed to adopt an expected loss based approach for provisioning. The key requirement under the proposed framework is to classify financial assets into one of the three categories. Stage 1, stage 2 and stage 3. The assets are categorized under these three stages depending upon the assessed credit losses at the time of initial recognition. And based on the requirements at each stage, the banks are required to make necessary loan loss provisions. I have a homework for you. Read about three stages of credit loss provisioning. Now that's all about this news article discussion. In this news article discussion, we saw in detail about credit loss provisioning or loan loss provisioning. The question displayed here is the main practice question for you today. You can go through the question write an answer and post it in the comment section so with this we came to the end of the news article discussion if you like the video hit like do comment and don't forget to subscribe to shankar ias academy youtube channel now thank you for listening